Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Well, the ATF is at it again. No, they're not actually making new rules, coming up with creative ways to disarm you. Instead, well, they are actually asking the Supreme Court to give them yet another pounding. That's right. We're going to talk about the case of what was once called Vanderstock v. Garland. It was a challenge to ATF's rules on unfinished frames and receivers, which the Fifth Circuit basically absolutely killed months ago. While it appears that the ATF has just not had enough yet, they want a petition to the United States Supreme Court, have them review it. But I don't know if they have the moxie to make it happen, and I certainly don't know if they actually have the court that's willing to listen. So today, let's get you all up to speed and let's talk about why is the ATF picking a fight that they can't win? Okay, so the case we're talking about today is now called Garland v. Vanderstock. It used to be called Vanderstock v. Garland, but now your United States government is the petitioners because Vanderstock has prevailed in the Fifth Circuit. This was a challenge to ATF's rules on unfinished frames and receivers in which the Fifth Circuit shockingly found that the ATF did not have statutory authority to regulate chunks of aluminum and other materials. They threw the rule out. They vacated the rule. The rule does not exist really in any way, shape, or form currently, and there is no other contrary ruling. And I want to point that out to you because that's really, really important because the ATF and the Department of Justice is asking the United States Supreme Court to re review a ruling of the Fifth Circuit where there is no circuit split. And so that makes things a little bit difficult. Now, before we get into the pleadings themselves and make this video way too long, in a nutshell, what the United States government continues to focus on is, is, listen, all we are doing is helping define the statute. We are giving further definition to terms that are within the statute. This is well within the rulemaking ability of the ATF. This all flows naturally. It's all naturally flowing from the language that's in the statute. No harm, no foul. What's the big deal? They actually probably used twice as many pages as they could have or should have or needed to in this brief because they repeat that over and over and over. And so if I were to highlight how many times that, we, that had been stated in this memorandum, we're going to talk about a really, really long video. I'm going to give you a few highlights. I'm also going to show you some of the sarcasm that the Department of Justice is dealing with here in the way they wrote this memorandum because they threw in some really, I think, sarcastic, rather unprofessional examples here. And I think this goes to show the desperation that the Department of Justice is experiencing right now. The Fifth Circuit's decision warrants review because it contradicts the act's plain text and effectively nullifies Congress's careful regulatory scheme. Under the Fifth Circuit's interpretation, anyone could buy a kit online and assemble a fully functional gun in minutes. No background check, records, or serial number required. The result would be a flood of untraceable ghost guns in our nation's communities, endangering the public and thwarting law enforcement efforts to solve violent crimes. This court has previously recognized the legal and practical significance of this case by twice granting emergency relief to allow ATF to continue enforcing the act as interpreted in the rule. The court should now grant certiorari and reverse. Now, this brief basically has two main components. The Fifth Circuit is a bunch of idiots. They didn't know what they were doing. And all of this totally naturally flows from the language of the statute. And this is well within the province of the ATF to define this further. As the Department of Justice put it, those provisions of the rule reflect the plain meaning of the relevant provisions of the act. In holding otherwise, the Fifth Circuit failed to meaningfully analyze the statutory text misread the rule, and misunderstood ATF's long-standing practices. And the Fifth Circuit's interpretation would frustrate the act's design and make it trivially easy to circumvent the central requirements of the federal firearms laws. And then in a nutshell, if you really want to know where DOJ is coming from, it's this right here. Statutory text and context make clear that the weapon part kits covered by the rules are firearms under the act, the act defines firearms to encompass any weapon which will or is designed to or may be readily converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive. Now, I should point out that the Department of Justice, for whatever reason here, has decided to refer to these items as ghost guns over and over and over. However, in the original ATF rule, they never used the term ghost gun. They called them privately made or personally made firearms. But we got to get back into labeling because now we're litigating. I mentioned earlier that there was some sarcasm here from the Department of Justice in how they're trying to petition the United States Supreme Court. 
Uh, one example is this. Even setting aside the Act's express inclusion of items that can readily be converted into usable firearms, a covered weapons part kit qualifies as a firearm as a matter of ordinary usage. If a state placed a tax on the sale of home goods such as tables, chairs, couches, and bookshelves, IKEA surely could not avoid that tax by claiming that it does not sell any of those items and instead sells furniture parts kits that must be assembled by the purchaser. So too with guns. Another example, a bicycle is still a bicycle even if it lacks pedals, a chain, or some other component needed to render it complete or allow it to function. So too, if the bicycle is shipped with plastic guards attached to the gears or brakes that must be removed before operation, or with a seat tube that the user must cut to length before installing, no one would deny that a company selling and shipping products in any of those conditions was engaged in selling bicycles. Now, if you're hoping that the ATF is gonna step in here and say, listen, we're gonna need to be able to draw bright line rules so we can tell consumers what qualifies as a firearm and what doesn't, here's the problem. They flat out say that's exactly what they're not gonna do. Actually, they need all this gray area because well, as we know, that's how the ATF likes to operate as they put in their pleadings. The rule thus accords with the natural reading of the statute in ordinary usage. As ATF explained, the crucial inquiry is at what point an unregulated piece of metal, plastic, or other material becomes a frame or receiver that is a regulated item under federal law. That is inevitably a question of degree that cannot be reduced to a bright line rule that addresses every firearm design. But the rules focus on whether a frame or receiver can readily be converted to functional status incorporates a concept that is familiar in the law and that accords with ordinary usage. Now, as you recall, the Fifth Circuit had a big problem with ATF's interpretation and flat out came out and ruled that, hey, listen, we've already defined what a firearm is. We've already defined what constitutes a frame and receiver. We don't need any further definition. And Congress has only delegated authority for you ATF to regulate firearms, not chunks of aluminum. The ATF is trying to do an end around with it like this. Indeed, although the court acknowledged that the dictionary definition of frame and receiver discussed above are the set well-known definitions of those terms, it failed to explain how those definitions exclude the partially complete frames and receivers the rule covers. And then a euphemistic way of describing what the ATF does is this. ATF's recognition that certain not yet functional frames and receivers have reached the stage of manufacturing that permits them to be treated as frames and receivers under the act both comports with the act's plain meaning and is consistent with ATF's long-standing regulatory approach. That's right, which is essentially just make things up as you go along change directions, do 180s, turn people from lawful citizens into felons overnight. That is their historical regulatory approach. Now, I mentioned earlier that right now, only the Fifth Circuit has ruled on it, and they basically have said, this rule sucks, it is gone. The United States government is saying, hey, listen, you just need to review the Fifth Circuit's ruling. Now, if the Supreme Court chose not to accept this, and there is no other contrary ruling from another uh, circuit, then the Fifth Circuit's ruling essentially becomes the law of the land. The Department of Justice tried to counter it this way. The absence of a conflict in the courts of appeals does not counsel against certiorari here. Even if the absence of a circuit conflict, this court has often granted certiorari to review decisions in validating important federal regulations or policies. And then finally, and you can always tell just how desperate a side really is, is do they end their memorandum with a big old coup de gras, here's the law, let's bang on that drum so everyone can hear it, or do they just take a personal cheap shot? Well, guess which one the Department of Justice used here? Respondent Polymer 80 appears to have manufactured and sold more than 80% of identifiable ghost guns that have been recovered at crime scenes in recent years. If the decision below remained in place, Polymer 80, along with the four other respondents that manufacture or distribute the products regulated by the rule, would be able to continue to manufacture and sell ghost guns online without complying with the act serialization and background check requirements, this would dramatically undermine the act nationwide. Now, to the ATF, thank you very much for doing this. I do not believe that the United States Supreme Court is gonna accept review, and candidly, if you're the ATF, you might not want them to. Because when you take a look at how they've been advancing 
or I should say reestablishing our inalienable rights, and how you take a look at how they've been whittling away at the administrative state with West Virginia versus EPA and the Loper Bright case that was argued this year. This is not a good time. This is not a good venue for the ATF to actually bring this petition. And so to the ATF, this is what I kindly ask of you. Do it. Please do it. Keep doing it. And let's see where this goes. I believe that the ATF is picking a fight here that they simply cannot win. The case, once again, is now called Garland v. Vanderstock. We will link up the petition for cert down below so you can geek out on it for yourself. If you got any other questions about this or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you guys should know how to get a hold of Washington Gun Law by now. If you don't, that's okay. That information is also down there in the description box. And then finally, let's everyone remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.